Kenneth Baker, looking back to 1979, now many historians and commentators see it as a great watershed in British politics, uh, the beginning of a new era. But I wonder, did it feel that way at the time when you were a conservative backbencher that day in 1979? Is that what it felt like? I think the first feeling in 1979 was one of relief that one had won the election because it was after the winter of discontent. And what 1979 marked, and one had a sense of this, that it was something special because the whole period, 45 to 79, is a remarkably consistent, uniform period. And that period was dominated by the architecture of Attlee. Attlee determined the architecture after the war. And successive governments, including Churchill, Macmillan, Heath, on the Conservatives, and all the Labour uh, governments as well, use that architecture and the architecture was a state-controlled economy with large nationalized industries and what developed corporatism the, or the organization of the economy with the CBI and the trade unions working with government everything would be marvelous everything in the garden would be rosy and it didn't turn out that way you had prices and incomes policies imposed by it that was all part of that period from 19 45 up until 1979. It's a period which I think could almost put a square brackets around and said irrespective of which government was in power, they were following broadly the same policies. There was no major denationalization. There was a huge, even for conservative governments, Ted Heath introduced draconian prices and incomes policy. And all this had, had run its time. It had failed hopelessly. And in 1976, we were bankrupt. We had to go to the IMF for money. And so it was the end of an era, and one did sense that even at that time. But did, do you th did you think that it might be the beginning of something quite radically different? Well, if you looked at the manifesto of the Conservative Party, you wouldn't have thought that, because the manifesto of the Conservative Party in 79 was a remarkably modest affair. There was no mention of denationalisation in it of any significance. Um, there was a general feeling that Margaret would be tough on public expenditure, yes, uh, and uh, monetarism was the great thing at that time. You'd watch the money supply and you would not follow the sort of uh, um, demand eco economics of the previous period, more supply economics. There was that sort of feeling. The really important um, aspect of Thatcherism was that it, it developed as it went along. And the critical budget was the 1981 budget, which when we were right down in the dumps economically, inflation was soaring, unemployment was very high, Margaret in, introduced, together with Geoffrey Hahn, I think it was very much her influence, a very tough budget, which, which was the beginning of the recovery of the economy. And that has been, I think, the greatest change in economic management since the war. And that, that also resulted in much greater prosperity for Britain. And if you look at Britain in uh, 1990 compared to 1980, you'll find a much more prosperous country. You'll find a confident country. You'll find a country where managers felt they could manage. One of the things that Margaret did set out to do from the very beginning was to curb the power of organized trade unions and the organized trade union leaders. She'd seen two of her predecessors, um, Ted Heath and Callaghan, destroyed by unions the coal miners in 1974 and the winter discontent in 1979. And she was determined that her head was not going to be the third on the trade union shield. Absolutely determined. And so the changes first in the legislation and then withstanding the miners' strike was a very, very important part of the success of Thatcherism. Because what the trade union leaders wanted to do was to run their own affairs as they wanted and to share number 10 with the Prime Minister of the day. And Margaret said no. It was Wilson who said to Hugh Scanlon, take your tanks off my lawn, Huey. But Huey had, didn't take his tanks off. It, it came down to Margaret Thatcher to remove the trade union tanks. But how did her attitude towards, for example, trade unions, very aggressive attitude, determined to do something about them in the way you've described, how did that fit with her, her uh, original intention when she stood outside number 10 on that day in May 1979 and she said, where there is discord, May we bring harmony? Well, much of the discord was caused by the trade unions. We'd had a winter of discord, and one realised that their powers were totally out of relation to their status in society. And so there had to be a correction in the balance of power. And as a result, there was more harmony. There were far fewer strikes after 1984-85. Far, far, far fewer strikes. There was industrial harmony.
Now, you mentioned the miners' strike. In terms of creating this different kind of economy, how important was it actually to uh, deal with the uh, perceived weaknesses of the public sector? I mean, I guess the biggest one was that the public sector was seen by Mrs. Thatcher and I guess by yourself as just consuming far too much of the national economic cake. Yes, one of the biggest changes that occurred under Thatcherism was the denationalization of the large industries. That was the Attlee inheritance, as it were, and it had not been disturbed for 45 years. Um, but uh, the first big denationalization was British Telecom. I, I was the minister who took it through, and that was not in the manifesto. And I went to market in 1981, um, uh, having taken one a modest bill through to end the monopoly of British Telecom, and I persuaded her, with the support of Keith Jones, that we should go further and denationalise. And that was a breakthrough, as it were, because it showed it could be done. But to just tell you an idea, to give you an idea of, of how hostile people were to it, when I first began arguing the case for the denationalisation of British Telecom, lots of Tories said to me, no, you'll never get it through. Um, there'll be strikes, the unions will strike against it. When you offer them shares, no one in the country will want to buy it. It's an impossible thing to do. But that was a breakthrough, because after that followed, well, Cape and Wise was the first, then it was British Telecom, and then it was British Gas and British Electricity and British Water. And I was the minister who actually did British Water as well. And that was a basic change, because the nationalised industries were overmanned, undermanaged, underinvested in, and not performing well for the country. Now, in all of those areas, and I'd even argue the same for railways, there's been an improvement. The amount of investment in the railways since privatisation would never have been paid for by any government. The amount of investment by the water uh, boards would never have been paid for by the British government. They always put water, water capital at the bottom of the list when you had to cut something. So there has been a dramatic change, and it was a change followed by the rest of the world. Other countries then started to privatise their utilities. And I remember going round in 1981-82 round Europe, trying to persuade the other European countries there was a good thing in the privatisation of their telecoms. And they said, you must be mad. These are natural monopolies. It's natural the state should own them. They're all privatised now, with the exception of France Telecom, which is the least efficient. Now, uh, you talk about the attitude of the rest of the world. Um, how uh, did Britain's role, do you think, under Margaret Thatcher her role in the world, how, how did that change? How do you think we were perceived by the end of her, her reign? Through her personality, and it was largely through her personality, we boxed in the class uh, above our capacity. There's no doubt about that. Uh, a part of that was due to the Falklands. I, of all the prime ministers I've known since Harlem and onward, none of them would have launched a fleet and an army to recover the Falklands. But Margaret was quite determined to do it against considerable doubts in her own party, I may say, at the time. But that was remarkable. And then the, then the, the Russians called her the Iron Lady. And I remember Ted Heath spitting through his teeth, saying that was the worst phrase that was ever used about her, because it stuck. And she became the Iron Lady. And she loved her role um, in world affairs. She was very close to Reagan um, and very helpful to Reagan. And in the first Gulf War, very helpful to Bush. I think he, 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 she put the lead in his pencil on that particular war, that weekend when she went over and said, you know, you must do something. Uh, and we were therefore right at the top table with Margaret. There was no question about that. There's a wonderful television shot of her attending the first ministers' meetings at the European um, Council of Ministers. And as you know, the photograph on these occasions is almost as important as a communique. And all these ministers were lined up on steps going down. And this footage shows Margaret slowly coming in at the back and slowly edging her way right down till she was right in the centre of the photograph. Now, Margaret did that instinctively, and she did it in world politics. And as a result, Britain walked tall. We were proud to be British. There was a tremendous change in morale in the 1980s. Absolutely tremendous. We did walk tall. Is there anything you think she got wrong with the benefit of hindsight? Uh, I didn't think she paid enough attention to her succession. <laughs> because the the the, uh, uh, the the inheritance, as it were, of, of the Margaret has been a very difficult thing to handle, and she's very reluctant to um, let go of the keys of number ten. I think she should have thought more about that rather than being pushed out very ungratefully by the party which she led so magnificently. Um, 
And so I think that that, that, that was difficult. And really, in a way, um, her success in some ways is Tony Blair, because he hasn't actually re-established the Attlee architecture. He hasn't renationalized. He hasn't uh, um, become a, 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 the state interventionist government that we had up to 1979 on the whole. He hasn't repealed our trade union legislation, though now the trade unions are gathering their strength again. And, you know, uh, we've got strikes now on the underground because of uh, militant trade unionism. Well, that's not welcome, but we didn't have those in the days of Thatcher. Just finally, on a personal note, what was she like to work for? Um, I was one of the Tories who was perhaps less enthusiastic at the beginning and became more enthusiastic at the end. Because having worked with her closely, um, she was a very good person to work for, in my view. Uh, because I embarked on the biggest change in education that we've ever had in the Education Reform Bill. We changed everything, national curriculum, city technology colleges, specialist schools, all the success of the education system today started then. I thought Labour would untangle it all. Now, that's very controversial. But Margaret totally supported me throughout all of that and made quite sure that we got the bill through. And I always knew when there were lots of Tories against, for example, city technology colleges, against grant-maintained schools, I knew that I'd have Margaret backing me at the end. And that's a very good thing to have. When, when you're the general commanding the army backs her lesser generals, I was a lesser general, if you like, <laughs> uh, it's a very reassuring thing to have. And, um, of course, there were difficulties in dealing with her. Um, Did you ever get a handbagging? Oh, on, on education. We had tremendous debates. All, all of my colleagues will tell you that from 90, after the election of 87, we were trying to formulate the national curriculum. There were tremendously acrimonious debates because Margaret wanted a very simple curriculum of English, maths and science, and I wanted a much grand, bigger one, more complex one of other subjects. And there were very rough words said over the cabinet table. But Margaret didn't mind an argument if you argued strongly with her. But if you were, hadn't got your facts right, I've seen her pulverise ministers, absolutely pulverise them, because th th they were arguing um, from, from, from a poor basis. Um, but I, I found it possible to deal with her. I like dealing with her. I knew where she was. I, of course, as her party chairman uh, for the last two years when she was there, I was very close to her and saw a great deal of how she worked. And as I say, I, I came to like her more. And, you know, she's always accused of being exceptionally right-wing. Uh, right-wing over the unions, her policy has been accepted. Right-wing over Europe, the famous Bruges speech from there. She was vilified over the Bruges speech. It, it's now the milder end of government policy, the Bruges speech. <laughs> and she was dead right on, the, on the, the predecessor of the Euro, the ERM. Dead right. And so she was certainly more right than wrong.